individual earthly personality, that is, the inner self and twelve main characteristics connected with the egotistical self. As Christ was surrounded by the disciples, so the inner self is surrounded by these physically oriented characteristics, each drawn outward toward daily reality on the one hand, and yet orbiting the inner self. The disciples, therefore, were given physical reality by the inner self, as all of your earthly characteristics come out of your inner nature. This was a living parable, made flesh among you, a cosmic play worked out for your behalf, couched in terms that you could understand. The lessons were made plain, as all the ideas behind them were personified. If you will forgive the term, this was like a local morality play put on in your corner of the universe. This does not mean it was less real than you previously supposed. In fact, the implications of what is said here should clearly hint at the more powerful aspects of godhood. The same kinds of dramas in different ways have been given, and while the drama is always different, it is always the same. This does not mean that a Christ has appeared within each system of reality. It means that the idea of God has manifested within each system in a way that is comprehensible to the inhabitants. This drama continues to exist. It does not belong, for example, to your past. Only you have placed it there. This does not mean that it always reoccurs. The drama, then, was far from meaningless, and the spirit of Christ, in your terms, is legitimate. As I said, the crucifixion was a psychic event, and exists as do all the other events connected with the drama. Christ, the historical Christ, was not crucified. He had no intention of dying in that manner. But others felt that to fulfill the prophecies in all ways, crucifixion was a necessity. Christ did not take part in it. There was a conspiracy in which Judas played a role, an attempt to make a martyr out of Christ. The man chosen was drugged, hence the necessity of helping him carry the cross, and he was told that he was the Christ. He believed that he was. He was one of those deluded, but he also himself believed that he, not the historical Christ, was to fulfill the prophecies. Mary came because she was full of sorrow for the man who believed he was her son. Out of compassion, she was present. The group responsible wanted it to appear that one particular portion of the Jews had crucified Christ and never dreamed that the whole Jewish people would be blamed. The tomb was empty because the same group carted the body away. Mary Magdalene did see Christ, however, immediately after. Christ was a great psychic. He caused the wounds to appear then upon his own body and appeared both physically and in out-of-body states to his followers. He tried, however, to explain what had happened and his position, but those who were not in on the conspiracy would not understand and misread his statements. Peter three times denied the Lord, saying he did not know him, because he recognized that that person was not Christ. The plea, Peter, why hast thou forsaken me, came from the man who believed he was Christ, the drugged version. Judas pointed out that man. He knew of the conspiracy and feared that the real Christ would be captured. Therefore he handed over to the authorities a man known to be a self-styled Messiah to save, not destroy, the life of the historical Christ. Symbolically, however, the crucifixion idea itself embodied deep dilemmas and meanings of the human psyche, and so the crucifixion per se became a far greater reality than the actual physical events that occurred at the time. Only the deluded are in danger of, or capable of, such self-sacrifice, you see, or find it necessary. Only those still bound up in ideas of crime and punishment would be attracted to that kind of religious drama and find within it deep echoes of their own subjective feelings. Christ knew clairvoyantly that these events in one way or another would occur and the probable dramas that could result. The man involved could not be swerved from his subjective decision. He would be sacrificed to make the old Jewish prophecies come true and he could not be dissuaded. In the Last Supper, when Christ said, this is my body and this is my blood. He meant to show that the spirit was within all matter, interconnected and yet apart. That his own spirit was independent of his body and also in his own way to hint that he should no longer be identified with his body. For he knew the dead body would not be his own. This was all misunderstood. Christ then changed his mode of behavior, appearing quite often in out-of-body states to his followers. Before, he had not done this to that degree. He tried to tell them, however, that he was not dead, and they chose to take him symbolically. 
His physical presence was no longer necessary and was even an embarrassment under the circumstances. He simply willed himself out of it. He knew that without the wounds, they would not believe he was himself because they were so convinced that he died with those wounds. They were to be a method of identification to be dispensed with when he explained the true circumstances. He ate to prove he was still alive, but they took this simply to mean that the spirit could partake of food. They wanted to believe that he had been crucified and arisen. Other religions were based upon different traumas, in which ideas were acted out in a way that was comprehensible to various cultures. Unfortunately, the differences between the dramas often led to misunderstandings, and these were used as excuses for wars. These dramas are also privately worked out in the dream state. In visions and inspirations, men knew that the Christ drama would be enacted and hence recognized it for what it was when it occurred physically. Its power and strength then returned to the dream universe. It had increased its vigor and intensity through the physical materialization. In private dreams, men then related to the main figures in the drama and in the dream state they recognized its true import. God is more than the sum of all the probable systems of reality He has created, and yet He is within each one of these, without exception. He is therefore within each man and woman. He is also within each spider, shadow, and frog, and this is what man does not like to admit. God can only be experienced, and you experience Him, whether or not you realize it, through your own existence. He is not male or female, however, and I use the terms only for convenience's sake. In the most inescapable truth, he is not human in your terms at all, nor in your terms is he a personality. Your ideas of personality are too limited to contain the facets of his multidimensional existence. The inner experience with the multidimensional God can come in two main areas. One is through the realization that this prime moving force is within everything that you can perceive with your senses. The other method is to realize that this primary motive force has a reality independent of its connection with the world of appearances. As there are portions of reality that you do not consciously perceive and other systems of probability of which you are not consciously aware, so also other aspects of primary godhood that you cannot at this moment comprehend. I have tried to give you some idea of the far-reaching creative effects of your own thoughts. With that in mind, then, it is impossible to imagine the multidimensional creativities that can be attributed to all that is. The term, all that is, can be used as a designation to include all of those probable gods in all of their manifestations. Now, it is easier, perhaps, for some of you to understand the simple stories and parables of beginnings of which I have spoken. But the time has come for mankind to take several steps further, to expand the nature of his own consciousness by trying to comprehend a more profound version of reality. You have outgrown the time of children's tales. When your own thoughts have a form and reality, when they have validity even in other systems of reality of which you are unaware, then it is not difficult to understand why other systems of probabilities are also affected by your own thoughts and emotions. Seth now speaks of reincarnation in terms of entire civilizations, such as those that preceded the existence of Atlantis. In a manner of speaking, it can be said that you have reincarnational civilizations as well as reincarnating individuals. Each entity who is born in flesh works toward the development of those abilities that can be best nurtured and fulfilled within the physical environment. He has a responsibility to and for the civilization in which he has each existence, for he helps form it through his own thoughts, emotions, and actions. He learns from failure.